Hi guys. Guess who? Okay, um, <clears throat> a couple points I want to make um, on uh, on this here. When I talk to people, they keep telling me I'm throwing everything out that I don't believe out of the Bible. It's like, no, I'm questioning the writer and what they're saying. I'm not questioning the fact that it's in the Bible, okay? And I'm also talking mainly to what I call the average everyday Bible studier, okay? It's getting them into being willing to test the words of Christ against the other uh, words of Paul and seeing how James, Jude, John, and 1 Peter all lend that they're trying to correct this. And now going through the book of Acts with a whole different perspective, and like I was going to make a note here and do just a little word search on Ephesians and Asia, you'll be surprised how many verses. As soon as I realize that maybe it's not the Jews who were wrong, who were trying to kill Paul, but it was Paul that was wrong for talking against the Torah. Because as we've talked, you're going to see all through the rest of this here, we're not going to run into, uh, well, we ran into James in 21 for a little bit. But Paul had nothing to do with the regular apostles, the true apostles. He was off doing his own thing. A lot of these is his own people and stuff. And so that is what I'm questioning and weighing out is between, you know, this stuff. And I always got the Hebrew people, or not the Hebrew, the Torah people that are against all this here and they have all this historical evidence showing that these aren't written by who and stuff and it's like this is what we have to go by this is what the average everyday person in life has to live by different translations and stuff they don't have access to all that other stuff see and so what I'm trying to do is help them to see what I can see as some key information to help guide their lives as they're going along so and I'm used to actually uh, being attacked by people and challenged by people. But uh, when people are trying to deal with stuff that's way over my head or where I have no access to dealing with information, then you've got something over me and there's nothing I can do about it. See, I want to talk to the average Joe person, Jane Joe, <laughs> and stuff. So, okay, we're going to go to... Chapter 22 here. I'm going to speed up through some of these because uh, I, I watch my own tapes and I miss stuff and I think of things I should have said and I think how this should have been corrected and so forth. But the whole idea is to get you and stimulate you to start doing more and more studying on this matter. And so uh, one of the things in chapter 22 that I thought was interesting here is he said, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. And he called it this the way. Well, way back here, they said, was it in Antioch? Is the first time they called them Christians? By the time he's sharing now, why isn't he calling them Christians? Does he see a difference between a Christian and the people of the way that are following Christ's teachings? See, they, these are just questions that, that I come up uh, wondering what, what's going on and why it's said like this and stuff. And so then we get down to verse 16 or 6 through 16. And he gives another, his one of his testimony. What you need to do is find all three places where he gives his testimony and print them out so you can look at each one of them and you'll see how incredible amount of variation is in there. And so I have a few details when I share my testimony that might vary, but the key details and key facts are all the same. I've gone back and looked at my own videos. <laughs> and one of the things in verse eight, he says, uh, and I asked, and he, and I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Well, first of all, if you go back, Jesus never ever referred to himself as that. People did, but Jesus never referred back to that. And he always called him Lord. And so uh, I just often wonder why, why that situation is. Okay, 17. Drop on down. When I had returned to the... Jerusalem and was praying in the temple I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me and I said Lord they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you and when the blood of Stephen your witness 
was being shed, I myself was standing by and appearing, approving, and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said, Yes, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Anybody who tells me they have falls into trances or they say, Well, the Lord showed me this, the Lord showed me, I got friends that do that. Oh, the Lord showed me, every day the Lord showed them something. And it's like, I just have a hard time believing that. Uh, that's just the way I am. So, uh, you know, you can accept that or reject that or whatever. 17. Oh, we already said that about testimonies and stuff. And it's funny because he started with the Jews too. And so, 25. But when they had stretched out for the wits, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by him, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen uncondemned? He plays the race card all the time. And the thing is, I've already gone through to the end. He is working up. He wants to see Caesar. His pride. He wants to see and get clear to the top to be able to share with those, with whatever his doctrine is and stuff. 23, 2. Oh, yeah, we're already there. Oh, 28 in the other one. The Tribune answered, I brought, I brought this citizen for a large sum, Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately in the Tribune was also afraid and they released, realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that they had bound him. See, he likes that. Somebody who is a manipulator likes to control people with fear. And so was he worried about sharing the gospel with them? No, he was taking care of himself. Okay, let's, now we're down to 23. 23-2. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who were standing by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting at, to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order someone to strike me? Those who stood by him said, Would you reveal, God, would you rival God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was a high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. That's, he's actually quoting Exodus 22 28. And so, uh, if Paul was a Pharisee, if he was raised as a Pharisee and his father was a Pharisee, how in the world does he not know who the high priest is? I'm just asking a question. Everybody says Paul's a genius. Everybody says how smart he is. Well, how in the world did he not know who it was? Now, when Paul perceived that part of the sat, this, they were Sadducees and the others were Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. He says that in present tense. It is with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. Now, we know that's a direct lie. We know we've already gone back when the Jews brought him and wanted to kill him and the Roman soldiers took him and rescued him, that they were trying to kill him for breaking the law, speaking against the law of Moses. So right here he is using a direct lie. That is not why he's, he's brought in there. See the prosecutor's tent, number six. Oh yeah, I already got that part. Second, in Second Timothy, why did I have that written down? Second Timothy 4.17. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Hear it. That says, Lord, awesome. Jesus off his cracker. <laughs> one of the guys said he was crazy. I can't remember which one it was that said that. But uh, at 23, yeah. But anyway, uh, as you're going through here, again, we're, we're talking about he's in prison. Uh, 23, 12, we're down to where, okay, the Jews made a plot, bound themselves that they'd take an oath they wouldn't eat or drink until they killed him. There was more than 40 who made this uh, conspiracy. And when the chief priests and elders said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath that we, you know, so forth to kill Paul, that his sister's son uh, in 16, uh, sister's son heard of this, the ambush, in the, from the barracks, entered the barracks and told him. See, Paul was being held by the Romans in a really nice uh, tent, the, the tent that he had uh, 
uh, it was for the guard or not for the guards but for the high higher guys uh, and stuff so 17 Paul called one of the Caesarians and said take this young man to the tribunal for he has something to tell them and so they went on and proceeded to talk about that stuff so and verse 18 through 22 he tells the story verse 23 then he called two of the Caesarians saying get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Chrysera at the third hour of the night also provide Paul's mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Phoenix the governor so he as a Roman citizen is taking advantage of all this situation that's a lot of manpower to try to protect one guy and so uh, uh, it was and then he wrote to Claudius here and you can read the story yourself, 31 through 32, 34. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipas or whatever. And on the next day they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. When uh, they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letters to the governor, they presented Paul also to him. On opening the letters, he asked, 34, he asked the, what province he was from, and when he learned that he was from Sicily, Sicily, uh, he said, I will give you a hearing when the accusers arrive, and commanded him to be guarded by the Herod's, uh, in Herod's tent, his fancy tent there, see, so. Okay, now we're down to 24, and I think I'm gonna stop. I'm trying to just finish up here, just about then. Uh, 24 again it's just back to the whole thing it's a story and events that goes on with Paul uh, verse 10 Paul gives his defense uh, they even accuse him of being the ringleader of the set of the Nazarenes in verse 5 they call it the Nazarenes see there's a different name by examining himself him yourself you will be able to find out about him and everything that which is accused of him Verse 18, I know this end is kind of getting boring, it's getting boring for me too, I'm just like, okay, same old stuff. When I was doing this, when I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult, tumult. but some of the Jews from Asia, see there again, the Asia, I need to write that verse down, uh, they sought to, uh, they ought to, be, to hear before you to make an accusation. See, he's talking about them. And so, again, it, it's interesting. I just can't believe how many the, the high priests and elders from Ephesus in Asia has come and they're trying to deal with this. And that's why uh, Jesus talks about them in Revelation 2, too, about their zeal and stuff for rightness. But they lost their first love. See, they're getting back to uh, the evil side of things, I guess. Direct him. 27 two years okay 25 and 27 when two years had elapsed Phoenix was succeeded by Porcius Festus and so Paul spent two years in jail he spent a lot of time in jail from here on so technically it was way back in the old days I had a pastor tell me that God had to put him in jail in order to get him to sit down long enough to write letters say people think so incredibly highly of him that they just don't catch on to what is actually being said and what is being written about him and stuff. So one three he wanted to kill him. They loved their Torah. Verse chapter 25, his defense. Your life is on the line. You will say, okay, verse 8. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I committed any offense. But Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and be tried on those charges before me? But Paul said, no, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. So the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If I'm a wrongdoer and have committed anything then which I deserve to die, then I do not speak or seek to escape to death. But if I, there is nothing that I've done, so this guy lies through his teeth. He did do stuff against the Jews. He did speak against the Torah. And I have other pages that, that share all this stuff, see? 
But when you're in a situation where you know people don't know all the all the information, then you can say pretty much what you want, and they'll believe that. But he wants to go to Caesar. Thirteen, Festus filled the others. Yeah, Festus has read all that stuff. Twenty-one down here. But when Paul had appealed to to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until. I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa, Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself tomorrow and I will hear it. So then again, Paul gets a chance to hear this and he likes to get out and talk and make a scene and everything. 20, oh, 26, 1 through 7 is his speech that he gives. 1 through 7. And read number 7b and 8. The, and for this reason, for this hope, I am accused by the Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Again, he's lying. It, they were never, he never was accused. The Jews never wanted to kill him for saying that God raised him from the dead. See? And so, but he also is playing his Sadducees and Pharisees game of uh, who, who and what stuff. So, And then verse 12, we get down here tells his conversion story. So verse 26, 12 through 18, this is third version of what his story is. And so you can read that one for yourself. And we're going to stop at the end of 26. Makes one sick, he is un upholding the law. 26, 20. But declared first to those in Damascus, then I, Jerusalem, and throughout all the regions of Judea and also to the Gentiles, that the, they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with the Pharisees. Whoa, where did we hear that from? John the Baptist said that to the Pharisees. Performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Hmm. I wonder how young he was when that statement was said. See, these are interesting things that, you know, people say, oh, there's no coincidences in the Bible. And so, okay, well, then if you want to believe that, then you've got to listen to, to what I'm sharing here and stuff. So, 24, and he was saying these things in his defense. Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words for the king knows about these things and I too speak boldly for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice for this is not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? And I know you do. And then they go on with their conversation through there and stuff and so anyway, um, Agrippa says this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. See, see, he's not worried about his freedom of going to share in the gospel. He wants to get up to the high guys. He's somebody in his own eyes, and he wants to be, be where he thinks he should be. And so, uh, anyway, read these stories, and again, just kind of do some comparison stuff. But uh, the last half of this, yeah, it's all about Paul. But it's just sad that uh, when you start questioning it, what, what you see and stuff. Father God, thank you for, for your word again, and I pray that you'll guide us and direct us and guide me, Lord. I'm just so excited about reading and learning stuff. And help us to uh, follow your words and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. So, next video will be the last one.